Uh, thank you all for the uh, opportunity uh, to speak uh, with you. I hope everyone is staying well, and I hope uh, the transition back to the new uh, academic year goes well for everyone. So I'm going to tell you about some work that's relatively new from my group that relates to the intersection of bacteria, uh, porous media, thinking about a soil, carbon, and the role of biosurfactants. And uh, this work was uh, done by mostly by Judy Yang, who I'll uh, introduce in a little while, but the talk has two short parts. It has the project that got us started, which was a question about how carbon is stored in soil. And then it ends with a second half, which asks if you have a partially wet porous media, um, is it possible that the bacteria can spread? And if so, uh, what is the mechanism? So uh, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about a, a problem related to soil carbon that we stumbled on. And the work was uh, published last year in the reference on the slide that makes it clear. I'm going to tell you about uh, information and imaging uh, in space, three dimensions, and time, one dimension. OK, so um, how does this begin? So I don't think it's uh, news to anyone that uh, there are a lot of events uh, over the last decade and in recent years that uh, provide evidence and indications of different manners affecting climate change. And in a recent IPCC statement from uh, 11 days ago, uh, you, you could find the statement of the need for immediate rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And as you think about uh, these issues, they're not only um, emission issues, but uh, where does the carbon go? And you may not be aware that although we talk about carbon in the atmosphere, which is shown on the blue circle on the right, there's approximately five times as much carbon uh, present in the soils. And I heard a talk about uh, soil carbon about three and a half years ago, given by a wonderful colleague, Ian Borg, who described some of the questions associated with this. And that led to this first part of the, our work. Uh, and uh, here I show uh, Judy Yang, who did uh, the work in collaboration with two colleagues at Princeton, Ian Borg and Jining Zhang, both experts in uh, respective fields of uh, environmental engineering and the geosciences. And if you look at what the National Academy of Sciences or other organizations say about the, some of the issues related to carbon, they refer to uh, negative emission technologies. In other words, how might you store the carbon if you don't have it stored in the atmosphere? And the soil is a clear possible reservoir. On the other hand, because there's so much carbon in the soil, it's also possible that if climate modification leads to release of that carbon, then the problem will only get worse. So the question is how to think about carbon storage and uh, carbon in soils. And climate modelers make models that describe on the horizontal axis uh, projections of time and on the vertical axis how much carbon C is stored in the soil. And you should uh, clearly see that although there are different climate models, and I'm not an expert on them, they are models, they have assumptions built into them, and the variability is enormous. And because of that uh, variability, it's very hard to think about and understand what are the uh, principles that might control carbon being stored in soils. And uh, if you want to think about this question, you have to realize that uh, clay in soils is thought to play a, an important role in holding on or absorbing carbon uh, that's present. And it was uh, from uh, a talk about this topic where many assumptions were being discussed that I, I asked my colleagues, why doesn't someone try to test the different assumptions to try to better understand what you should believe and disbelieve in the models? And that led to an effort uh, that is referred to in a few places in the literature uh, as soil on a chip. And, uh, I give one reference on the slide, but if you're interested in other work in this area, you can look at uh, work from uh, Edith Hammer, Toby Kears, and Tom Shimizu, who also have uh, recent work in this general area. So what we did is uh, we were interested in clay, so we chose a transparent clay called laponite. We we're interested in different molecular weight uh, carbon molecules, so we use fluorescently labeled glucose or dextran of different molecular weights. And we'll do different forms of confocal, we'll use, do different 
experiments using confocal microscopy to try to track what happens when you see aggregates of clay here shown uh, in green because they have um, carbon absorbed into them and uh, what happens when you add bacteria and we're going to use a common soil bacterium uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we're going to try to bring all the elements together that people talk about when they're talking about projections of carbon and soil. And so a typical confocal experiment with a small molecular weight carbon compound, in this case glucose, is shown here where time runs on the horizontal axis and uh, fluorescent intensity on the vertical. And the experiment is done by first flooding a microfluidic channel that has a few soil particles, which are sketched here and left on it. And you can see a video playing. Uh, carbon is brought in, it absorbs into the particle, and then we flush everything out with fresh water and the carbon goes away. And you know, you could think about this, for example, as what happens maybe after rain or something like that. So here within a couple hours, there's an absorption process and desorption. And you'd refer to this obviously as, an as a reversible uh, process involving carbon and soil. If you use a higher molecular weight molecule, in this case, uh, a dextran molecule with uh, on the order of a few thousand Dalton molecular weight, what you see is that after the flooding experiment, carbon gets absorbed into the clay particles that form these soil aggregates. But if you try to flush it with water, only a little of the uh, carbon comes out and the majority of the carbon remains trapped in the soil particle. And uh, you can, and we're going to refer to this at least on these time scales of several days as uh, irreversible uh, adsorption process. Uh, now you might ask, what does bacteria do? So if you add, uh, do experiments with a fluorescently labeled bacteria here shown in red, because the soil aggregate is uh, made up of many uh, clay particles that are, have uh, thicknesses on the order of a nanometer and uh, diameters of these clay sheets on the order of 25 nanometers. The pore size in these aggregates is small and, it, and therefore the bacteria get stuck on the outside and they can't penetrate in to where the uh, carbon might be trapped. And this picture is consistent with some other suggestions that have been you know, made in the past for linking uh, biology, in this case bacteria, to the soil carbon problem. Uh, so if you just looked at this image, you might say that uh, clays apparently protect uh, carbon from the bacteria because they can't get into this pore space where the bacteria uh, reside. So uh, we then uh, recognize that there's uh, issues with this because the bacteria, of course, can produce enzymes that can uh, break down uh, different molecules. And so we did an experiment in a microfluidic chip shown here on the left, where I'm going to be, you'll see in the upper left, uh, a set of uh, phrases that tell you the kind of experiment. We're going to first flood it with uh, molecules of different molecular weight. Uh, then we're going to uh, flood it with water. Uh, it's, uh, everything will be spit up. And then we're going to flood it with an enzyme uh, that breaks down uh, dextran and or glucose. And uh, so the experiment goes like this. You uh, first prepare the experiment by adding in different molecules that you see they absorb into the clay. You flush it with water. Uh, red is a higher molecular weight molecule that doesn't get in. And now you add the uh, extra enzyme. Uh, the enzyme is a small molecule that rapidly gets into the clay and it uh, breaks down these <clears throat> higher molecular weight molecules, releasing them back into the water. And so what this uh, movie demonstrates is that uh, the presence of enzymes outside the bacteria produced by the bacterium, for example, are capable of releasing uh, large molecular weight compounds that would otherwise be trapped in uh, soil. And so it, it turns out in the literature, there, were, there are a number of observations that are consistent with this that are sometimes referred to as a priming, where it's observed that the presence of small molecule sugars leads to excess uh, carbon being released from the system. And that's consistent with this idea that uh, growing bacteria produces more enzymes. Enzymes can penetrate, break down the molecules, which then become small enough to diffuse out of the soil. And so that's our kind of first, that's my first story. Uh, to conclude it, I'll just point out that the, the experiments suggest that 
uh, when thinking about modeling of the role of carbon in soils, um, you can go back and ask what the modelers think. And the generic picture is shown here where uh, the, the scientist thinks about either small molecular weight carbon that is reversibly absorbed on surfaces or large molecular weight carbon that is trapped within soil aggregates. But from our perspective, they don't necessarily completely account for the role of the microbiology where the presence of bacteria and the presence of enzymes can make this story such that breakdown of the large molecular weight molecules by the enzyme enzymes will produce small molecules that can then be released. And so I think what we'd like to suggest is that this kind of uh, small scale experiment using imaging at every in any modality you think will help will only better inform models and hopefully reduce in some ways uncertainties and predictions going forward. So that's my um, quick short first, st first story on an interplay of uh, biology and, and, and environmental engineering. But because we were doing experiments with bacteria in these model porous media, Judy ended up also making a uh, a wonderful new observation that now I'm going to tell you about in the second part, which is uh, the movement, the, the macroscopic movement of bacteria in a porous media that uh, is partially wet. And what I mean by partially wet is that there's water air interfaces in many places. Um, now, it, for those of you who might know something about this literature, the presence of an interface, and I've already mentioned a surfactant, um, might make you think of the Marangoni effect. So I just want to put to rest right away the following suggestion that what I'm going to show you is not the Marangoni effect. And I'll tell you why we believe that, even though that's the common um, feature seen in other areas of uh, bacterial biophysics when you see fluid motions. And this is a collaboration not only with Judy Yang, who's now at the University of Minnesota, but Joe San Filippo is on the faculty. Um, in Indiana, Nikki Abbasi is a graduate student with me and two of my wonderful colleagues in molecular biology, Summer Gittai and uh, Bonnie Bassler. Okay, and if you want uh, more information, uh, uh, we have a paper that was just accepted. So this short story goes like this. Uh, it's well known uh, probably to all the people in the audience that uh, bacteria can swim in liquid and you know there's a rich literature on that. Oops, notice the misspelling. Um, there are many experiments done on the surface of uh, petri dishes where people, uh, researchers look at different kinds of uh, bacterial swimming and or swarming. There, there, uh, there is a presence of a liquid air interface between the agar surface and the air. And uh, my colleague Sujit Datta uh, has been uh, pioneering new efforts to understand bacterial swimming in uh, saturated porous media. So uh, porous media say filled with water. Basically it's still the British swamp. <laughs> and uh, what I'd like to uh, suggest is, what if you now ask the question, which is really quite a, a nice idea that comes up many places, what if you have a porous media that's only uh, partially wet with water? It could be packaging material or tissue or just soils that are, 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 have been dried out uh, for a while. And so that's gonna be the question that we pose. And we're gonna start with just a, a simple, a geometry of a, you know, a physicist or engineer's porous media, which is a single pore that in this case is, has a triangular cross section that we'll just refer to as corners. Um, many porous media, of course, have angularly shaped objects. They have sharp and narrow regions. So this is a plausible way to think about what happens in this pore space. And uh, the experiment goes like this. You put a bacterial solution at the bottom and it's exposed to air at the top, and then you just image over time. And uh, the three angles in this triangle are 90, 60, and 30. And the if you observe this over many hours, what you see is that nothing happens at the 90 degree corner. A little motion is observed at the 60 degree corner, and significant motion is observed at the 30 degree corner. And it was this movement that uh, got us very intrigued, uh, not surprisingly, when Judy asked me what I thought, I said, oh, the Marangoni effect. Uh, and, and then she sub did lots of experiments to show that that was not true. So I'm now going to tell you in these last uh, 10 minutes, um, maybe I won't even need that long, uh, how we went about studying this problem and why we believe 
it's important. And at the end, in my last slide, I'll tie it back to the porous media. So you're allowed to ask, why is there any movement in this problem? And uh, so we're going to make a measurement of the interface position versus time. Uh, most of the time, we see uh, only a little movement at the larger angle of 60 degrees. And so we're going to focus on this 30 degree uh, angle. And we're going to measure uh, distance versus time. And if you measure uh, displacement versus uh, time, you get a typical curve if you have the wild type bacteria shown on the graph. Uh, notice a couple things. Uh, first of all, the motion doesn't happen until after about uh, seven hours. Uh, we'll comment on that, but it needs growth of the bacteria. And uh, in this case, we're going to argue at the end the, the presence of a, a biosurfactant. And if you're interested in, might this be important, the interface moves millimeters per hour, and that's comparable to bacterial swarming. So we would suggest that this macroscopic motion has every bit of importance that you'd normally ascribe to uh, other kinds of bacterial movement. Although uh, we'll now then ask more questions related to the mechanism. And so the, the first thing you might ask is, is swimming important? So you do the same experiment, position versus time with a mutant that um, lacks the flagellum and the experiment is essentially identical. So swimming isn't important. Um, to this effect. You can do the same experiment uh, removing pili, the, say the type 4 pili, and in this case, uh, whether you don't have the pili or inactivate the pili, its a ability to uh, pull or retract, you get effectively the same curve. So these last two slides, we would argue, rule out all forms of bacterial motility as being important to this. Now, Judy had the idea that surfactants were playing a role in some sense. And, oh, I should say the other thing is, in, you know, in all these experiments, again, after about seven hours, everything starts. It's a very reproducible kind of experiment. Um, but Judy had the idea that quorum sensing might uh, be playing a role. So she used a, a bacterium with a... Um, uh, deficiency in the last R in the uh, last gene, and uh, there you see the curve shown where my cursor is. That there's now a long delay of over 20 hours, and then eventually you get some rise, about half of what we did before. But in the um, bacterial system, there are two different uh, biosurfactant uh, possibilities due to two different genes. So even if you uh, delete the last R gene, there's another system that can get turned on later. And so uh, Judy and Joe uh, Sanfilippo then used a mutant that wasn't capable of producing any biosurfactant. And that's shown here. If you um, have the experimental system with the cells, but no biosurfactant, you completely turn off um, the motion of the interface. And so this allows us to uh, conclude that uh, biosurfactants are uh, predominantly playing a role in this, and quorum sensing, in fact, uh, all can uh, be a controlling mechanism uh, for a major part of the dynamics. Now, to understand what feature of the interface is allowing motion, which isn't due to, say, swimming or something else, um, we did lots of experiments where we measured some physical property on the vertical axis as a function of time. We measured the concentration of the cells in the solution. So they go from small concentration up to some large concentration. So the cells are accumulating. And then we make physical measurements, both of the surface tension of the solution here denoted gamma and the contact angle um, denoted theta C. And the contact angle starts at a large value of over 100 degrees, which you would call partially wetting in the surface science literature, but it ends up down closer to 60 degrees after a long time. And if you measure the surface tension, it similarly drops from a large value of on the order of clean water, which is 70 millinewtons per meter, down to a value of about uh, 50 uh, or so millinewtons per meter. And in, as you know, in interfacial science, there's a pressure difference whenever you have the curved meniscus. That pressure difference in equilibrium is twice the mean curvature times the surface tension. And what we're now going to suggest is 
the change in the contact angle in conjunction with narrow geometries uh, give rise to a, a change in the curvature, which is driving the motion. The curvature changes after the sufficient biosurfactant. How long? Uh, in this experiment too, after on the order of seven hours, you get a discrete change in the uh, surface tension and contact angle. And so we're going to argue that it's biosurfactant driven wettability changes that are uh, at, behind this spreading mechanism, every bit as fast as uh, uh, swarming or swimming that drives motion in a partially saturated porous media. Howard, there is a out, terrifying question. Yeah. Uh, yep. So I, I wanted to ask a clarifying question from David Lubensky, and he's saying, uh, I'm confused about where the bacteria are in this experiment. Oh, are bacteria this are wherever you see the solution on the bottom with the fluorescent okay. color. Okay. So the experiment starts, David, uh, I, I think I tried to say it, but that's probably unclear. The experiment starts with bacterial solution at the bottom, and the rest is filled with air. Does that right. help, David? So the question was whether they're suspended or they're film on the surface, and you're saying they're, they're suspended. suspended in solution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks, David. Okay. So the claim now we're going to make is that it's a biosurfactant-driven effect. We're going to argue it's changes in wettability, but to rule out the Marangoni effect, um, we did the following experiment. We did the experiment on the left, which has neither biosurfactants or cells. It's sort of a control experiment. Nothing happens because there's nothing there other than the solution without the surfactant or the cells. But then we did an experiment where we grow the solution up in time. We filter out the cells and we put a pure solution in the experiment where you see the fluorescent color is the solution. And again, you get the same kind of rise at the small corner. So this solution has uniform surfactant everywhere. And so we believe this rules out the Marangoni effect um, and drives home the fact that it's a wettability change due to surfactants absorbing on the solid surface. Um, to show that this applies within a real porous media, if you don't like this analog of a single channel, um, Nikki Abbasi and my group working with Judy then made the following kind of mimic of a porous media. We took a an array of PDMS grains of different sizes and different shapes, uh, place them in a channel. We put the bacterial solution at the bottom. So it's the same kind of experiment that David was just asking about the bacterial solution at the bottom. It's dry at the top, but there's a porous media at the top. We show then the results of two experiments. The lower experiment I'm gonna show you has no biosurfactant present. And the upper solution is again, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa solution after 12 hours. And again, what, Sorry. And again, what you see is that uh, when there's no biosurfactant, nothing happens. But when there's biosurfactant present, the surfactant is capable of spreading on the order of a millimeter or two, um, you know, kind of an, an hour speed. They spread through this uh, porous media. Yeah. So what was it five or six millimeters there in 12 hours? Okay. So that we think this then ties together our kind of model experiment and a the suggestion that these effects can, can take place in real porous systems. Okay, so with that, I'll stop. I've told you two stories uh, that started a couple of years ago, really started for us after I heard this talk on soil carbon and, and, and started to talk to colleagues, you know, how can you use the, the methods of biophysics and bioengineering to, and microscopy to try to address some of the modeling assumptions people made. And, a consequence of it was also then Judy discovering this previously unrecognized transport mechanism. And with that, I've used 23 minutes and so I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, for a wonderful talk on a very timely topic. So we have a number of questions and I'm going to try to ask as many as I can now and the remaining during the informal Q&A. So the first question is from Greg Huber and this relates to the slides you were showing on the mechanism for corner flow. And his question is, can you study the approach to a zero degree angle? Oh, yeah. Great question, Greg. And hello, Greg. I haven't seen Greg in a number of years. OK, so the first, I did forget to tell you one thing in the interest of time. The, so the, the, the shape of an interface at a corner, if you've never studied it, is a fascinating question. If you give someone a corner of a finite angle, then for any contact angle effectively uh, larger than that 
uh, corner, it is, um, uh, it can be, let's see, how does this work? It can, the interface can be reasonably happy. It can find an equilibrium, but, for a, a contact angle below the corner angle, there's actually a formula that tells you the right relationship. Um, there's no equilibrium. And when there's no equilibrium, the interface just continues to rise. And the first two references on this uh, amazing feature, uh, which I think is little known, the first paper is by a mathematician, uh, Bob uh, Conkus and Finn, and they even include an experiment. And I think Yves Pomo about the same time had realized this conclusion. So if you change the corner angle, uh, Greg, you change uh, whether or not this will happen because the whether or not you get the rise depends on the contact angle and the corner angle. And the contact angle has to be small enough that it can't reach equilibrium within the corner, a static equilibrium. Thank you, Howard. Uh, so then next question is from Navish Vadwa, and he's asking which species of bacterium is used in the triangle core experiments? This was uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I think I said it at the end, I forgot to say at the beginning. All right, and uh, then there is a question from Christoph Schmidt, and Christoph is asking in what form is carbon mostly stored in soil? Are the bacteria themselves a good way to fix carbon? Okay, you're, you're pushing the boundaries of what I know. Certainly polysaccharides of many different molecular weights are common in soils. And in the soil science literature, they you know, document the different ways the systems are broken down. You're asking just growing up the bacteria, is that a good way to store carbon? I think the issue with that is the carbon are gonna, the bacteria are gonna respire. When they respire, they produce CO2. And uh, that's, not what you want to be happening. All right. Uh, then there is a question from Ming Ming Wu, and she's asking how common is it for soil bacteria to secrete biosurfactants? Uh, well, I don't. Again, pushing my knowledge. What I what I believe I understand is that in in this quorum sensing system for a con in this bacterial system for this common soil bacterium Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the, the mere fact that it has a quorum sensing circuit leads to the production of biosurfactant. It's a natural feature of the bacterial lifestyle. I, I'm not an expert on all of the details of different species or whatever, but my understanding is it's a natural part of their lifestyle. Now, Ming Ming's probably an expert and can tell you, tell me if I just got this wrong. Ming Ming says thanks. And then I will take uh, read another question from Robin Bruinsma. And he's saying, are the surfactants, he's asking, are the surfactants not reducing the surface tension? Yeah, the surfactants do reduce the surface tension that, that I showed you, but they also change the wettability. And okay. the net result, we believe, is that changes the equilibrium. You're now out of equilibrium from the initial state. As soon as you're out of equilibrium, then you create a pressure difference in the fluid and that drives the flow. Yeah, but I, I, I agree, but um, you are also rising against gravity. And if the surface tension gets too weak, I would guess that the capillary rise will stop. If the surface um, tension is reduced by the that, surface that, that, that tension, would, that is true if you think about the capillary, you know, like a circular capillary. That's true. Um, and I can't speak to every general case, but I can speak to the clean geometry of a corner. If you have a corner, and this is, and you could tell me if this is wrong, but I can just tell you what the theory is for the ideal corner for a given surface tension, no matter how small. If the corner, if the uh, contact angle, uh, corner relation, corner angle relation, doesn't satisfy a certain inequality, there is no equilibrium. So the prediction then is that the fluid is always trying to move because it can't find a shape that satisfies all the geometric criteria. Thank you, very interesting. If so you, you want to send me an email and I can send you the 
uh, I think I have the Pomo paper, but I certainly have the Conkus Finn result, which is just asking what should the equilibrium be? And I think it surprises many people when the claim is there is not an equilibrium. Does it mean that the thread of fluid is getting thinner and thinner? So the gravity is, is yeah, going to zero it means well? it's getting thinner and thinner as it goes higher and higher in the ideal case. Now our experiment is finite size, of course, um, right? But uh, anyways. Thank you. And I'll ask a final question and then move on to the next talk. So the final question from Navish Vadwa is, is evaporation important in the corner flow experiment? Yeah. Evaporation is important in the real experiment. So we did experiments to, control, to you know, monitor this. Uh, we measured evaporation over a long time and only report the experiments over a finite time when we think evaporation is only changing the water content by say 10%, but evaporation does play a role. We don't think it affects the dynamics, but it certainly is changing the experiment over many, many hours.